start off with military spending. And uh, one trillion dollars is what is spent on military spending by nations in this world. Deaths due to war, 16.9 million in the 20th century, representing 1.6 million a year. 8.5 million since World War II. Land resources impacted by the military, thinking in terms of the army bases, the air bases, areas off limits due to landmines, as Wood pointed out, even landmines planted in World War II, areas off limits because of that. Areas contaminated due to nuclear tests. In the introduction, uh, the it was pointed out to you that Wood was a, one of the last Canadian survivors of the tests that were conducted by military around the world to see whether, in fact, tactical nuclear warheads could be used to fight wars. And that's contaminated whole areas of the United States, which are off limits now, of the Soviet Union. The same types of tests were conducted in China. Areas that were they used uh, in the South Pacific when they were doing the atmospheric nuclear tests as well. Areas contaminated due to chemical warfare testing. Infrastructure, towns, buildings destroyed. If you look at Beirut, Beirut has been destroyed and rebuilt four times in the last 20 years as a result of military action. A huge waste of resources. Military dedicated roads, rail lines, the destruction of infrastructure, uh, infrastructure that needs to be rebuilt after wars, water and electrical resources that are impacted, reservoirs that are being uh, uh, destroyed, uh, water supply systems that have become septic, in Afghanistan, 10,000 villages destroyed, along with the water supply systems and reservoirs needed to serve them. Contaminated water supplies causing disease and death to civil populations. Crop production loss due to the disruption or contamination of water supplies. Famine due to warfare. If we look at what's going on in Africa today, in the Horn of Africa and Somalia, the famines that are, 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 are sweeping various parts of Africa are directly related to the war activities that are taking place. Waters, the water electrical systems are disrupted, impacting the, uh, the activities in hospitals, schools. Consumption of fossil fuels. Just think of how much fuel is used to keep 70,427 aircraft flying. Think about how much fuel is used to power 76,108 naval ships. How much fuel is consumed by 217,582 tanks. How much fuel is used in the the process of positioning artillery pieces and how much fuel is expended when you have 148,000 plus missiles. Then we come to nuclear weapons. And somebody who's got a little bit more experience in nuclear weapons than myself, I'll let him speak for that. Nuclear weapons. These weapons are in a class by themselves. They're not operated by military agencies, but by s separate agencies. And that's where you'll find them if you start doing some research. It's now 26,000 weapons. And of those, 4,000 are, uh, uh, are in launch status. 2,000 of the 4,000 are held by the Americans. 2,000 are held by the Soviets, by the Russians. A launch on warning, there are detection, ra uh, uh, radar detection systems. 
And as soon as one of uh, a, a missile that's, that's carrying a nuclear warhead is detected, that information is sent to the to your own launch people. Now you can look at. Uh, there are different systems. One system says that it goes to a committee, and the committee then evaluate the hazards and the dangers and the and the and the the, the, the chances of surviving. In any case, launch on warning is a very, very dangerous situation. As we sit here tonight in this building, there are 4,000 uh, devices on the globe with the apparatuses, with computers and detection devices ready. It's almost reached the point where the, where the computers do the launching, not human beings. Now, I think it's absolutely essential that th those 4,000 be, uh, those systems be deactivated immediately. But I think it's equally important that we get rid of those 26,000 warheads because if the nations succeed in cutting the carbon emissions to that particular tip over point of controlling the global warming at plus two degrees, we're all going to sit back and say, oh, oh we've done it. We've, 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 saved the, we've saved the globe. We haven't. So long as there's a single nuclear weapon that is out there, that is capable of being fired, then the hazard remains. And having gone through that, I can assure you that it means nothing less than nuclear winter and total destruction of the civilization that we understand. What we have to do to, to do this. Well, I say that we have to get involved. Um, Vancouver used to be uh, uh, known for its peace marches and so on. You're lucky now if you get two or three thousand out. I'm going to read a paragraph here from one of the uh, 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 pieces of writing of one of the members of the executive of Veterans Against Nuclear uh, Weapons. His name is, is Ed Schaefer. He's an economist uh, and he says, most experts in the field, including historians, suggest that the conditions the global climate is now experiencing got underway as a result of the Industrial Revolution, when, the, when the, the availability of mechanical methods of moving and doing things uh, came about, uh, it replaced the hand-to-hand the -hand combat uh, and, and moved the thing into the thing. The 20th century was one of the bloodiest in the history of civilization. War was waged most almost continuously and weapons were substituted for manpower as the century progressed. This significantly increased global warming. So we must find ways of dealing with international differences and conflicts by diplomacy and discussion, not by military intervention. There is an um, ironic possibility that the forecasted reduction in global resources from global warming and environment de degradation could be sufficient to convince nations not to take military action to resolve their disputes. We try to distance ourselves from the issue instead of personalizing it but we are all in the same boat, the boat together, whether we like it or not. Most, if not all of us in this room, paid our income taxes. About $10 billion of that money that the federal government collected from us is directed to Canada's military. It 
could have gone instead to social needs such as health care, education, low-cost housing, eradication of poverty. You say that Canada's not touched? Agent Orange has been used at Camp Gagetown and we as Canadian citizens will soon be paying pensions to Canadian servicemen who have been exposed to the dioxin of the Agent Orange anything. We as Canadians are affected by this. 65,000 well-trained and educated Canadians are in our armed forces as part of its military activity contributing to the environmental problem. If they were diverted into Canada's workforce, they might be able to contribute more, uh, to, we might be able to contribute more to other issues uh, we have in Canada. Well, I, that's it. Now, I hope that by now you see the connection between military action and the environment. Because until I started putting this thing together, I was convinced that the environment was the number one issue. I still think that. But in order to deal with it, we have to deal with this. Thank you. If you can change your vote when you change your mind, that is what democracy is all about. Now, polling.ca. Perpetual democracy doesn't mean that you have to vote every day. It just means that you have the right and the ability to vote anytime you want. And that is what perpetual democracy is all about. Mm -hmm.